So uh, I'm here with Blake Willis, uh, cousin of Bruce Willis. Is that true? Six cousins. Six cousins. My ones from great, me. my five great grandfather had 21 kids. So okay. There's about 10,000 of them. All right. So lose connection. So Bruce, just remember your cousin. Anyway, so um, <coughs> I do a little bit of a few other things on the side. I do have my own consulting company. Reason I, the main reasons I come to these, uh, one, are, are just because the VSD community is awesome. Um, and two, uh, especially this time, there were a lot of networking subjects, which really interest me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I'm also um, on my clients that do use, um, uh, both of my clients use like Linux for all of their systems. Okay. But, um, I have managed to convince one of them that ZFS is a really good thing to be using as their backend store for all their stuff. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. So, so okay, so uh, and so it's open BSD used mainly uh, in private use. I yeah, I run, I run a, um, I can give you a good, a good story actually. Um, so the way that I got into open BSD and the BSDs in general. Um, was uh, in early 97, I started working for an ISP. And uh, you could have employee colo in the ISP. You could have, basically have a couple units. It wasn't even like a rack, it was like an Ikea bread shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, this was yellow colo. You know, this this, this yeah. thing used to be a dentist's office, so much so that like the bolts that had the dentist chair and the floor were still in the floor, oh, yeah. right? Um, and uh, they just kind of bolted racks to it <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, and uh, so we had employee colo, and I didn't really know anything about, um, I guess I had kind of piddled around with Linux a bit at the time, um, but wasn't really getting it. And uh, so when I started working for that ISP in early 97, uh, and they gave me some employee colo and like uh, you know, a 10 meg Ethernet port and I could use whatever I wanted to, which in 97 was a lot. Oh, yeah, that was... um, I mean, within reason, right? You know, yeah. They're like, don't, don't run a porn site on it or something, yeah. right? That was kind of the, the unofficial policy. So, uh, what I did was I went on the uh, Usenet news group. Um, I think it was uh, rec.computers.forsale. No, misc.computers.forsale.workstation. Okay, so I went on there and um, basically got like the most esoteric, weird ass hardware I could get my hands on, which was a Sun 3X. It's a Sun 380. Okay, this was the last workstation Sun made that had Motorola CPUs in it before they went to Spark. Oh, yeah. Okay, dinosaur. Um, and the only thing that ran on that was NetBSD. Um, you couldn't even run Solaris on it because uh, it like isn't the Spark, right? <laughs> um, so uh, I took like probably three weeks, and and oh by the way, it didn't have a floppy disk drive, which for me coming from like the Wintel world was like, all right, so what do we do here? And so it took me like two or three weeks to figure out how to net boot that thing. Luckily, we did have some Solaris machines in the uh, knock there at the time where I was working. So I figured out how to net boot it um, and, uh, and got NetBSD running on that thing. And um, I'm a really big fan of the band Rush, um, which if you remember back in 1997, you know, now everybody pretty much takes like uh, free hosting for granted. But at the time, a free web page was two megabytes of static content on GeoCities. That's pretty much what you could do, right? So I was like, I want to learn how to be a sysadmin. I want to have users on here that like will ask me for stuff and I can interact with and they'll tell me when things are wrong and so forth, but I don't want to have paying customers either in case I screw this up, you know, I don't want to have to do any content. This is not a business. This is me wanting to become a citizen. So I went on the Rush mailing list and I said, hey, if you've got a crappy uh, Rush band site hosted on GeoCities, uh, which like they wouldn't even let you run a CGI for a guest book on there, um, 
like come put your stuff on my machine. I've got like an 80 meg hard drive and and like 16 megs of RAM um, and Apache and like come most of your stuff here. And uh, so the site is 2112.net um, and it's still going. There's one, uh, the other site's pretty much petered out after a couple of years. Um, funny enough, like there's a ton of brush fans in South America, which I had no idea about before I did this. And like, that was one of the really, really cool things for, for like 20 year old me, you know, coming from rural Virginia. And it's like, wow, I have like three Brazilians and an Argentinian guy that have a fan site on my server. Like this That's is cool. interesting. Um, and, and a guy in Indiana um, still maintains it. And if you look for like Rush fan sites, it's like the second or third biggest one. And he keeps, he, like, while they were still together in touring and stuff, he was like updating this almost every day. Um, it's pretty hardcore, actually. I just make sure the server works. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. And, and so, like, that was NetBSD. And because um, that was the only thing that would run on that Sun 3X. And then, um, uh, shortly thereafter, um, I guess, uh, I probably for like security reasons, I had, you know, at work we were, um, we were just converting um, a bunch of servers from Telnet to SSH. For you? Yeah, this was early 97. Um, and um, so I'm like, what's this SSH thing? And I think that's how I found OpenBSD. I couldn't tell you exactly how I found it. Um, uh, I think it was that and the fact that I, I probably got my hands on like an old Spark Station 4 or something um, and uh, and like stuff that OpenBSD would run mm -hmm. on and, and like because <coughs> uh, OpenBSD didn't actually run on Sun 3X. It ran on Sun 3 but not on Sun 3X. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sun 3 was like even slower because the, the X means it's got an MMU because <laughs> it was a 20 megahertz 68030. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty much almost exactly the same hardware as a Cisco 2501 router, actually. Jesus. Um, <coughs> yeah, well, that, it does put stuff into perspective. Yeah. It's like when you said you had an 80 meg hard drive, but I'm like, yeah, and that was like a lot. <laughs> okay. That was, you know, a, a SCSI drive that was way faster than my IBE stuff that I had. Oh, yeah. So, um, so I had some like old x86 hardware lying around or whatever, and I installed, I believe my first OpenBSD around then was 2.2, uh, which had such features as uh, VI in the installer so that you could use VI. They're, they like, it gave you um, the man page for a disk label, right? And showed you what an example disk label looked like. And then there's like, okay, so now we're gonna run VI and you get to write your disk label. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I, I'm i pretty sure I got it right the first time. I probably screwed it up the second or third time, but I'm pretty sure I got it right the first time and the thing actually worked. Um, this was like the first release from what I recall of OpenBSD that actually had an installer. Um, memory's a little shady on that, as you might imagine. But um, ever since I moved my, uh, my stuff to, um, to Spark 4, and some, you know, some 4C, uh, and, um, and uh, x86, um, I've always run uh, 2112.net on, um, on OpenBSD, and that's, uh, believe it or not, I actually had some SynMail consulting gigs because I knew how to run SynMail for my own mail domain. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and in general, like that experience is what got me into to sysadmining and, and like uh, I was working the, the midnight to eight shift there so I learned how to do DNS and then I started doing DNS on OpenBSD because it worked like a whole lot better than on Solaris um, and was like way more secure because we had a bunch of Solaris boxes that got rooted all the time. Yeah, and they, they would have uh, so send mail exploits. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and so when you were saying you were doing the consulting gigs, that yeah. was with the, your company uh, L33 L33 Networks, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and what, so what's your kind of like your core competencies that, you know, someone saying, oh, I need a BSD legend. Uh, what, that, like, that's what not me. <laughs> that's <laughs> not me. Yeah, well, uh, uh, um, <laughs> no, I'm a network architect. 
Okay. Um, but what I'm really interested in, one of the reasons that I come to EuroBSDCon is to talk to people about um, OpenBGB and all the other, like the MPLS stack in OpenBSD, for example. Um, there was a really good talk at the uh, the last talk of the day. Uh, uh, Sean. 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 Sean, sorry. I should probably edit this. Yeah, no, yeah. Sean yeah. Susan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Sean from Joinit um, had a really good presentation on how they're using uh, FreeBSD and its VXLAN support yeah. uh, to tie their uh, cloud virtual guests together. Which is really cool. sucked, though, like only 60 gigs on a single GSP connection. <laughs> really crap. Nice. I need to improve that. No, it was absolutely amazing. Like, I was like, oh my god. That's, that's, that's pretty serious. Cool. Like, and you know, you can see it, like, it's, it's really cool innovations. I can hope that some of the lessons learned from that can be applied in other BSDs uh, yeah. in, in some way. Because it's actually, I was, I was surprised when you were saying, well, it's in the kernel. Like, you know, like, okay, that, that gives me hope, because you know, people don't like you doing NetMap or any of that, you yeah. know, user and that stuff. So um, that, that would be quite exciting to see that kind of go, you know, somewhere else. So Yeah, the other interesting performance revelation I had uh, this time was uh, during Aaron Glenn's talk. Because I'm a router guy, okay. I don't really mess with. I mean, I I know firewalls. I use them. I wouldn't consider myself a security expert. Um, uh, I could certainly tell you what not to do. Uh, <laughs> but um, what I was not experience. aware of, what I was not aware of, uh, yeah, I could just sit here and tell stories. <laughs> um, what I wasn't aware of, I'm always looking at uh, performance in the OpenBSD network stack. Uh, primarily as like an MPLS router, right? Um, or, or like a full table BGP router. Um, and so at that, uh, in that respect, OpenBSD right now tops out that from my, my understanding from, from Peter is around 2 million packets per second. Yeah. Maybe a little less or around, depending on what hardware you have, yeah. of course, in your memory bandwidth and so forth. Um, but what I was not aware of that Aaron kind of gave me a little bit of a light, light comes on moment um, is that if this is just, you know, a bump in the wire uh, bridging firewall, that the performance is like maybe one or two orders of magnitude higher. I mean, he could do 14.4 million PPS line rate across normal x86 hardware and, and like fill up a 10 gig NIC. Um, as a firewall with BF, with uh, as a matter of fact, with all four of the BSDs and the various firewall modules and stuff, they all work pretty much the same way. And and his talk actually, he he felt that it was kind of anti-conclusive because he was hoping to find performance differences, right? Yeah. Uh, and say, um, I don't know if you were in the talk or not. I, I was in part of it. Yes. Yeah. I was interviewing um, Bob. Oh okay. yeah. So yeah. That, 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 that was that was good fun and yeah. uh, it went on because it was interesting and then yeah. I went, oh dear, I'm after missing that at all. But uh, yeah. yeah. So he was trying to find performance differences in in the different BSDs and the different firewall modules because there's like all these forks of PF all over the place and stuff. Um, and it turns out there really aren't any. At least on 10 gigabit, you would have to go up to 40 gigabit or 100 gigabit to start seeing differences on a not terribly powerful machine. Or is it that? Was that with full size, let's say 1500 byte frame, uh, 1500 byte? That was with IMAX. Mm -hmm. uh, and he tested three things. He tested like line rate, so with 64 byte packets, IMAX, and with 1500. And the um, even with 64 byte packets, he got to the 14.4 million line rate of 10 gig on PF with no routing. But that was with 400 typical PF installation. So that was four. four Million flows, uh, four hundred rules, and um, and like PPS is as fast as the, the ten gig NIC would go. That's and, and would, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I missed that talk. Yeah, it was really cool, and and so uh, you know maybe I'll catch up with him because uh, I've got some. I don't have any NICs faster than ten gig, but um, I've got some pretty nice AMD Epic hardware now that has like more I.O. bandwidth than our entire old server park put together. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, well, like, uh, we're using, we use a uh, live for, kind of, for an Intel, okay. uh, 4 gig uh, cards, um, pretty nice. 
Yeah. So we use we actually call it local or geek. And switch is, you know, the cool. Yeah, talk talk to me afterwards and I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll get a tip for you on that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, though, the we, reason we use. use 40 gig. Yeah, we, yeah we're, we're. So, we're, you just got the Arista 750QX32s. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the nice density. Like, it's in 96 10 gig boards in one year. Yeah. Can't go too far around. Although, obviously, you're limited on. You have restrictions. You got a lot of breakout cables and yeah. stuff like that. In a lot of pain, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, but still, that uh, so that and we use OpenBGPD. So you were saying yeah. you like to play with OpenBGPD as well, or yeah. Um, so we use it for a bunch of stuff. Um, we use a combination of um, essentially when I need like a looking glass or something like that, I'll use OpenBGPD. Um, I, I like to use it for folks with training and stuff because it's just really easy to get people up to speed. Um, the, uh, we also use ExoBGP a lot as like route injectors and stuff like that, where you just need something that's really small and simple, where it just for service keep alive type stuff, right? It's just a little Python script that does a liveness check every minute, and then like if the service isn't working, it like changes the BGP metric, for example, to, okay, sure. to say like only use me as a last resort because my thing's not working, or slow, or whatever, like famous that's sure. yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's cool. That's like for the training, do you do with something similar? Like with like you know, uh, I was at uh, Peter yeah, Hester's talk, right? Yeah, yeah it's it's really so good. He's, like, he's kind of what inspired that. Yeah, I love giving uh, new hires that haven't worked with BGP before. Love you know, is even with I mean, virtual routers are cool, and there's all these simulators for them and stuff, but. Uh, it's nice to to get somebody a little bit out of their comfort zone where like you know that somebody's not just gonna be able to Google this stuff and copy paste. They like actually have to understand how it works in order to make it go. Yeah. Right. Um, and and also like with with Peter's demo that he does with VMN, you know, I think he has like thirty some odd VMs and each one has like, a four. Like, so he, yeah. he would have up to thirteen right. class. Yeah. He'd have his teacher and there's two and then he has two for each okay. student. So he's got like sixty four yeah. open BGP little VMs on there. And that's pretty cool. And then of course Henning they start forming and walk in the lab and injecting loads of roots and trying to yeah. simulate the internet table. Naughty boy Henning. But uh, yeah. but it's I have to say that's very enjoyable just to see because you know, like it, you know, I've been to a few of the tutorials because each time I'm learning something new, so it means that each time I've gone to the tutorials, so if you've gone to one of his tutorials in the past few years, I'd certainly recommend uh, going to them again because you're you just gradually get more and more confident with it, and of course because you've done them already, you can start to explore and push the comfort zone of the right. and. Uh, and uh, Peter is such a great guy, like he, he, he will answer any question as best yeah. he can. Uh, you know, he, he, he wants to share knowledge, mm -hmm. which is uh, one of the reasons why I think um, Blake and myself like coming here, and Blake is more of a veteran than I am, I'm only a new on the block, uh, and it's one of my regrets actually not coming sooner. But, uh, you know, because I, I would have been intimidated by all oh, these awesome people. Yeah. Well, this is only my third BSD conference, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of Peter that, that dragged me into it. Um, the uh, as a matter of fact, it's only my second BSD con. You so know? your last one was in Paris, yeah. Oh cool, man. So we. Yeah, I mean, I've been using BSD, BSD forever, but, but, but yeah. No, I, like on the, even like on the BSD side, you would be the use that lot longer than me. I'm like I think 2005, so I think it was 3.8. And they wouldn't run 64 bit on EMT 64 Xeons because. They didn't have no execute bit in hardware, so yeah, it. yeah. I yeah, remember kind of that sucks. And I think that good. was the net burst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. those weren't any good. Yeah, I think yeah, that that died in hardware. Yeah. Uh, so, but like, it was, so then they kind of it kind of went off the boil for a while, and then I think about two thousand and eight or two thousand nine, they started wanting to do two thousand nine, do more with SSL termination, so he was stoned because they didn't know about yeah read a D. Um, and and uh, so you still to as a reverse proxy, you know, to to allow to, uh, transparent tests of termination in front of a reverse proxy analytics request and then feed it back into the site. And we had you know DNS bind you know was true and it worked. And I, I had to do fake all to keep it going. It was 
kept going, yeah. which was pretty nice. And that's um, that was actually one of the challenges of trying to learn all the maze teas that I found that the stuff works. So you work around it every day. Mm. It was like okay, that's you, you yeah. do you do a tab job. It's a task to get open BSD or do some work. If you do open BSD, then it's something. Just it's hard to do. <laughs> move on to the next problem, and suddenly like, you're finding yourself working on it or the others. And then it was only when we started to actually start to seriously look at uh, open BSD for networking. Yeah. That you suddenly are in it every day and you make lots more mistakes right. Right. and right. it's a living environment. So, so you're like, how do I do this without restarting? The box, you know, right, you start to right. kind of get a bit more savvy with the, the commands to try and just push in the changes, you know. And, and in fairness, they have a lot of atomic, you know, can, the way they, they can actually atomically I implement the changes to configs and PF and PHP, uh, PHP, uh, the PHP CTL, stuff like that. And then suddenly, kind of, okay, I'm kind of getting the hang of this. Sure. And that, it, is, it is pretty nice. Um, and so, like, what's your favorite uh, aspect of OpenBSD at the moment, or BSD? Uh, 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 BSD or BSD top? Uh, what's, the, what's the favorite yeah. feature of BSD to um, use? All right. And then, I'll ask you what's the okay. favorite thing about BSD. So, um, in, a, in a professional con context, and funny enough, I don't actually use it on BSD because of the, the way that my clients work, but um, I have recently uh, discovered ZFS. Uh, specifically open ZFS on Linux, but I've got the FreeBSD handbook sitting next to my desk because there's like a couple chapters on ZFS, that's like the ZFS manual, right? Yeah. Unless you want to Google uh, really old Oracle docs. Uh, and um, I am, am like a big time convert. If you'd asked me six months ago what file system to use on Linux, I would have said XFS. Um, but like, I started poking around and also um, I think over the last uh, year or so, really in the last six months, honestly, um, uh, OpenZFS on Linux has got enough maturity that several uh, fairly high profile Linux projects are using it as their backing store. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of signaled to me that this, was, that this was ready to go and there are some other file systems on Linux that, uh, that just really scared the heck out of me. So. I was glad to have something that was a bit more advanced. So the folks that were kind of championing those other things that I found were really not uh, particularly stable um, or reliable, uh, that I had a, a successful counter argument to their arguments of, well, this thing has snapshots and it's got you know rollback and, and like uh, remote copy and all this other stuff. And I'm like, well, actually, is that a best kind of has been doing that for about 15 years? And and like it hasn't been doing that in the Linux kernel for 15 years, but the latest kernel, uh, the latest OpenZFS on, on Linux is actually having any trouble with it yet. So I'm gonna put one in production in a couple of weeks. I'll let you know how it goes. That's pretty cool. Well, <laughs> no, it certainly if I was if I was doing a storage system, uh, I wanted to do it on FreeBSD and uh, ZFS. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like it. internally we use more on the, the OpenBSD side and the mm -hmm. network side. More because I just like to clean the open PHPD integrated with the kernel and yeah. the power domain and stuff like that. Um, and obviously with, with FreeBSD or free range routing, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's like I look at it from a distance, so I have to put that disclaimer. It just doesn't feel like it's it's all like I, I think it's a very performing product right. and a lot of people are liking it, but I just feel it's a bit more disjointed than Yeah, it's kind of like some of the other stuff in Linux, right? It's there, it works, but it's like doesn't really feel that polished. Yeah, it's you know, and and it feels like maybe the the direction. I guess maybe with the BSDs, like the the governance of the project is a bit more centralized, yeah. right? And they're also to to be fair, like there's probably an order of magnitude fewer people that use the BSDs, all the BSDs together, than than Linux, right? So. Um, you know, the, the, there's maybe an advantage to that in that uh, the BSDs kind of have a little bit more control over things and there are a whole lot of fewer actors like trying to pull the project in whichever yeah, way they're, they're they, want, they particularly want to go. Or it's, like, it's just like this giant ephemeral thing that everybody has a stake in. And, and so like, it's not really that the, the governance is kind of more all over the place. And Absolutely. Um, another thing that, uh, 
that I learned going back to OpenBGPD uh, that I uh, discovered at this uh, EuroBSDCon was um, I knew that uh, I guess a lot of folks have seen the slides where with PF, um, you know, OpenBGPD keeps uh, it uses the same table structures in the kernel as um, as PF and everything else, right? So they can share internal labels on routes and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I knew that you could write uh, like a PF rule um, that matched like an AS, a BGP autonomous system number, for example. Okay. And then, like I think one of my slides is where he's like rate limiting um, a certain large German telecom carrier. <laughs> uh, what I didn't know. Um, is that in, at least I guess in the latest versions of PF, um, you can do that on any BGP attribute. Um, and so you can actually like write a PF uh, firewall or shaping rule to like a BGP community. Yeah, that's right. And cool. it will actually like group all our else together that have a community and like create a queue for it. Yeah. And and the, the big box vendors are, are, are just not gonna this, this is not going to happen. This and it, it's really awesome. Yeah. Then they are you going to pay like, through the rules for it? And uh, they, they, they don't have that use case, right? Yeah. Because I think one of the things that, that fundamentally makes open source software, uh, and specifically when we're talking about networking, stuff like OpenBGPD, um, different is that all the development is driven by the users. This is not vendor-driven development where, or uh, as, uh, as an old colleague of mine, Randy Bush, would say, spaghetti testing from a wall's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not that. It's, it's really much more about, like, I needed this thing, or somebody came up with it and just coded it up and then got the other people's feedback, and it kind of grows a lot more organically. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons that the BSDs are, are quite polished, yeah. um, because there is... I think there's quite a balance of like commercial, um, like large commercial companies and and like either small businesses or individual developers in the BSD community, whereas Linux there's a whole lot more like big corporation type stuff. And the other thing I think is, is you have a lot of academic researchers so mm -hmm. who are doing peer review of, of any right, test you're doing, right. so it's not like you kind of go, oh this is a great idea because you know, we can sell more of this product. Mm -hmm. it's like, that sucks because of this, this, and this, address those, and then it might have a chance of getting committed. And so, so suddenly you get these more polished, uh, better polished uh, features. Sure. But certainly, like the community as well, like, I mean, it's brilliant. Like, uh, PGPV, Spam D does it. Uh, you've got, and you can use the communities to, like, as you were saying, like, basically load stuff into tables for PF and then right. actually block them or, or divert them or whatever. And that, that is it's incredibly powerful. So is there anything else you'd like to say to the, the people, like, um, or sorry, what, I never asked you, what's your favorite aspect of Euro BSD Camp? My favorite aspect of Euro BSD Camp? I think it's the community, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there are a few people here that have said to me, you know, they see me hang out with Peter and so, and they've said to me, this is like, of all the conferences that I go to, or all the like developer groups that I'm in or whatever, like this is the most friendly and welcoming, right? Um, you know, there there is a code of conduct. Um, I'm not on the, the EuroBSDCon board or anything, so I don't know if there's have to if they've had to done had had to have done any enforcement activity on the code of conduct. But the fact that there is one and has been for a while already speaks volumes about how seriously we take the fact that this is a, a, a community that's um, that's well, what being well uh, yeah, more to everybody. Absolutely, yeah. and it's uh, there's a woman with a baby here. That was good. That, that's not going to happen at, at like. <laughs> yeah, no, like I, I didn't get to meet her, um, but yeah, no, she was there and she was yeah, baby. it was fantastic. And, and like, she had the little uh, yeah, pouch. baby Jordan. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it was cool. Like uh, yeah. And uh, I think there, and I think we need to, and we love, we certainly love to see more uh, people from uh, all the sexes, all the different races. And we, we had a lot of people traveling the world to get yeah. here, and we had quite a few from Asia, mm -hmm. and 
And, and it's nice to see that quite a few from uh, you know the United States uh, or sorry North America, let's say it's Canada, US. Uh, and it was, it was really nice. So what we would be saying is that if you are worried about how people are really open, really friendly here, um, and uh, genuinely the people are out to share, um, you know, uh, people are out to help you. Like if you have a question, the person who may not know the answer will tell you. You need to talk to that guy or that girl. You need to talk to that person. They know yeah. ones, and that's really cool. And for me, when so I certainly would recommend or encourage all the people at home who might be kind of oh, maybe I should go or maybe not. Yeah, you know, the, least, the hallway track is amazing. Like just coming out, watching that. Yeah, oh, you need to check this Absolutely. project out. I spend as much time on the hall, even you know sometimes. Uh, like I, there were some talks that um, let's say uh, there was a talk that I would. I'd like to have attended, but it wasn't one that I was like specifically here for. Um, and and like I just got tied up. Like just discussions from the previous talk kind of ran yeah, over yeah. into the next one. And like this was this was great. Also, I think you know we were 188 people this time. Um, last time I can't remember where how many we were, but it was around that kind of yeah, number, yeah. right in the 200 ish. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's um, that's a lot less intimidating than some of these huge conferences yeah. that are like over 500 and stuff. It's also harder to find. The more people you have, the harder it is to find a venue. Yeah, and it's, and it's harder it is to find people in the venue when you yeah, want to talk exactly. to them. That's um, it's, 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 it's an intimate, it's yeah. an intimate in, a, in a genuinely nice way. And mm -hmm. people, the organizers are super helpful. Um, and but we just love to see you come and talk to Blake. He has been super helpful to me about uh, you know, ask when I ask him questions about vendors and stuff like that, we've we exchanged war yeah, stories. We, uh, and we like breaking the uh, breaking the vendors. Uh, yeah, we we make it hard for them sometimes. Yeah, yeah. They make it hard for us, yeah, so that's why we make it hard for them. You know, yeah. so until until they pay me to fix their bugs, then we're going to continue to have this, you know, this um, kind of absolutely. relationship. And we, we we you know we we have support group and we go oh, that that, that bug sucks and. And it's great just to bounce ideas sure. because Blake has been super helpful. I remember in the middle of a maintenance window, we got chatting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I had to push that one out. <laughs> I was like, oh, dude, I got it. I really got to start this. But it was, it's great. And it's because I met him, because he uh, at the European Steacon, because it's been so open and helpful. And uh, you get to meet great people like him, and you get to tolerate people like me from time to time as well. So. But definitely yeah. we want to have you, uh, and just uh, thanks very much for watching. Yeah. And Blake, you've, been, you've been super helpful to me too, thanks. I right, appreciate that. All right, thank you. Thank you.